Greetings and uh, welcome back to the Illumination Talks. And today we're going to look at uh, early science and miracles. And the, the man I want to look at most here is uh, Hieron of Alexandria. And I'm not even sure if you're familiar with Hieron, but he was like the Leonardo da Vinci of the first century AD. He was uh, known as the Mechanicos, the machine man, because he made all of these intricate devices, and we're going to look at some of these, including you know, uh, metal birds that sang and slot machines and all of this um, sort of very high-tech equipment for the first century AD. And, well, he wrote several papers, and the one we're going to look at today is the Pneumatics of Heron of Alexandria. And this was translated, the copy I'm using is translated in 1851 by uh, Bennett Woodcroft, of the, who was the Professor of Machinery at University College London. Um, and it's interesting to note the, the quality of the, the, the science that was being performed in the first century. We, think, we tend to think this as, as, as being a very long time ago when they didn't have proper science. They didn't have proper education. But of course, for the elite who had been to you know, the best of the universities um, in the sort of Roman Empire, the education could be quite high and of very good quality. And of course, Hieron of Alexandria went to the university at Alexandria, which is probably the most cosmopolitan and advanced city in the Roman Empire. Anyway... Hieron says uh, of pneumatics, before proceeding to our proper subject, we must discuss the vacuum. Vessels which seem to be empty by many people are not empty, as they suppose, but full of air. Now, the air, as those who have studied the physics are agreed, is composed of particles, both minute and light, and for the most part, invisible. If then we pour water into an apparently empty vessel, air will leave the vessel in proportion to the quantity of water which enters it. Which is all very true. So uh, you can displace the quantity of air and that air has to, has to rush out of the vessel into which you are pouring water. And that outrush of air or the vacuum that can be caused if you take the air out, can be used in a mechanical device. And that's what Hieron of Alexandria was doing with some of, his, um, some of his machines and inventions that he had made. It's also worth noting that Woodcroft says of Hieron of Alexandria, Hieron states that he has added his own discoveries to those handed down by former writers. So quite obviously, Hieron was standing on the shoulders of previous scientists uh, who in, had already invented many of, the, um, many of the machines that he was going to actually uh, build in Alexandria. And let's look at the uh, first of these inventions. And this is a, um, a fire pump for pumping water. Now, you might find this uh, a rather simple device, but for the first century AD, perhaps this is actually a little complex. So you can see here the uh, fire pump has two cylinders uh, with pistons pumping up and down. And the cylinders are immersed in water, so that um, shaded air at the, the bottom is, is water. And you can see the entrance holes for the water at the bottom and the water enters the cylinder, and there's a realization, of course, that if you lift the, cylinder, lift the piston within the cylinder, then the water will rise up within the cylinder, which is exactly what it will do. And then you can pump it down and divert that water via a valve system, and it comes out of the tube that is um, placed in the center there between the two cylinders, and you can pump water exactly the same as you would do today. We would use this simple system for exactly the same usage, for pumping water, for pumping air, for, say, a foot pump into a car tire. 
in exactly the same fashion. Remember that this is the first century. And so the, some of the engineering they were using uh, is very similar to the engineering we would use today. Um, a more frivolous, perhaps, example of the uh, machinery and mechanics that uh, Hero had invented uh, is this one, which is, um, well, here we have a, a sort of mechanical man with a sword, and his sword will come down onto the neck of the horse, and it will go through the neck of the horse, but the horse's head will not fall off. So again, well, this is just to amaze the aristocracy and, and, and the royalty uh, with this marvelous machine, and nobody knows how it works. And it's a, a bit of a miracle, you might say. But of course, inside the horse, there is a, a complex set of gears that allow the, the sword to pass through the neck without the horse's head falling off. It's a simple but complex mechanical device with a complex set of gears inside the horse. Uh, very clever, in fact, very clever. The next one is perhaps more useful because it could actually be used for some useful purpose. Here we have a, uh, uh, a windmill which is powering a pump to pump a, an organ, so you can play an organ. Um, and it was possibly even used, we don't know. But um, so we have the windmill turning on the left and it turns a shaft and the shaft turns a gear system which is actually using uh, cams rather than using a, a crankshaft. But I mean, it would work. It's probably not as efficient as using a crankshaft, uh, but it would certainly work. And that set of cams make the uh, lever on the pump go up and down. And that pumps air, and the air will go into the organ, and you can play your organ. Not sure why he used cams on this instead of a crankshaft, because the Romans did know about the crankshaft. They used them in their wood yards um, in the south of France, certainly, uh, where they transferred rotary power of a water mill, uh, a water wheel, uh, transferred the rotary power into linear power using a crankshaft, so they could cut up logs to make planks of wood. Uh, all fairly high-tech in a way. And the last one is interesting because it's a different sort of device entirely. This is a um, steam engine from the first century AD. So we have a big, uh, like a cauldron underneath, which is full of water, and you place a fire under that uh, cauldron, heat up the water, that would produce steam, obviously. The steam goes up those two tubes, you can see, into the sphere. And uh, the sphere has um, a couple of vents on it, which are angled, so that as the steam comes out, it rotates the sphere. And so you get this steam engine, a rotating sphere powered by steam escaping from this vessel. Um, and again, this is, this is made to entertain the aristocracy and the royalty, but it's not too difficult to see that this could be transferred to something more useful at a later date. It wouldn't create much power, um, but you could adapt this mechanism to produce more power, because essentially this is the same mechanism that powers the generators that run your electricity in your house. Uh, they are powered by a steam turbine. Okay, that steam turbine use, uses blades instead of vents, but it's the same principle. High pressure steam turning um, heat energy into mechanical energy in exactly the same fashion. And this is the first century AD. So there was some fairly high tech technology in the first century. But what does this have to do with my biblical research? my alternative view into New Testament and Old Testament history? Well, because many of the miracles, I say, are based on technology such as this. Miracles like the, the wedding at Cana, which comes up in uh, the Gospel of John 2, uh, 2 verse 1. Um, 
where they had this wedding at Cana where um, the mother of Jesus was officiating and, and Jesus was officiating as well. And they, they were short of wine. And being a bit of a cheapskate, uh, Jesus didn't want to go out and buy any more wine. So he thought, well, I know, I'll turn some water into wine instead. Which is exactly what he did. And the quote says, Jesus' mother said to the servants, Whatever he asks you to do, do it. There were six water pots, and Jesus said unto the servants, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And then he said to them, Draw out the liquid and bear it to the governor of the feast. And of course it was turned into wine. It's a miracle. Well, maybe not a miracle. And yet that miracle, that, that text from this old book, which claims a miracle, has become the basis for many people's belief system. They believe in Christianity. They believe in these events because of this miracle. This supports their idea that Jesus was a son of God. But they've deceived themselves which is very sad because they have a whole life based upon self-deception. It's very, very sad. Very, very sad. Because, why do I say this? Because one of the favourite tricks of Heron of Alexandria was turning water into wine. And this is a well-known trick from the first century AD, so why don't people join up the dots and realise that this turning water into wine in the Gospel stories was actually a trick made by Heron of Alexandria. I don't know why. Self-deception again. They don't want to look at the truth and realise the truth. Anyway, what does Heron say? Well, here's his, he made lots of these. He made six or seven of these vessels, uh, all with a different mechanism. Um, this is probably the one that, that Jesus was using here. This is um, two vessels. And... Um, the quote from Heron of Alexandria explains how it works. And he says, Two vessels are standing on a pedestal. Well, you can, you can see them there. One is already full of wine, and the other is empty. So one is secretly full of wine. You don't tell anybody that it's already full of wine. Whatever quantity of water is poured into the empty vessel, as much wine will flow from the other. Ah, okay. Now we know what's uh, happening here. So you have this set up in advance. You come along and you say to someone, look, I'm going to pour water into this, uh, into this jar over here. Look, it's water. You can come. You can have a look. You can taste it. Yeah, it's water, isn't it? Yeah, it's water. Look, I'll pour it into this vessel over here and you put your cup under there and look, as I pour it in, it comes out the other side as wine. I've turned water into wine. It's a miracle. No, it's not a miracle. It's a displacement of air, as we saw in the previous quote from Hiron of Alexandria. It's a displacement of air from the first vessel into the second vessel. So how does this device work? Well, as you pour water into the left-hand uh, vessel, as you look at it, uh, that water goes into the vessel and it displaces air from that vessel. That air goes via the tube in the pedestal into the second vessel, and the second vessel can now force out the liquid that's in it, which is wine, and suddenly you get wine out of the other side. And of course this can be made more dramatic if you have clear water and red wine because now you're putting in a clear liquid, and out of the other end comes red wine. It's a miracle. And that's what miracles are made of. I like this one best, though. Um, I don't think this is the one that Jesus actually used, but this, this is slightly more technical, this one. It takes a bit more explaining, but it's, it's a very, very intricate little device, this. This is a um, water-to-wine jug. Um, 
And okay, so uh, as you can see, although no one else can see, the, the, the people you are trying to amaze cannot see, that the jug is divided into uh, two, um, two sections. So we have two compartments inside this jug. Um, so what you do is you place wine in the bottom compartment. You can pour wine in there. It's got little holes you can see on the right side in the uh, separator between the compartments. And you fill up the bottom of this uh, jug with red wine. Uh, when, once you've finished filling it up up until the level of the uh, compartment, then you put water in the top compartment of this jug. Okay, so now you've got water and wine separated by this uh, compartment. Um, you then offer your guests that you want to amaze, you then offer them some wine. And what you do is you put your thumb over the little hole which is marked K in the, in the handle. that You can see um, at the top of the handle there's a little mark there called K. There's a hole there. You put your thumb over the hole. Now, when you do this, you are preventing air getting into the lower compartment. And because of uh, suction, because you're preventing the air getting in there, and because of water surface tension, the wine cannot escape from the lower compartment. And so what you do now is you pour out water, because the top compartment contains water, you pour out water for all of your guests, and they're getting water. And then you'll say, well, now I can give you wine. And so all you do is you take your thumb off the hole in the handle, and now wine comes out of the same vessel. The same vessel has turned water into wine. It's a neat trick, isn't it? And it's quite technical, because you've got to understand suction vacuums, surface tension of water, before you can understand how this mechanism actually works. This is the first century, of course. This is the first century. Um, another one I want to look at is a miracle by Simon Magus. Now, I'm not sure if you know about Simon Magus. He does appear in the New Testament on one occasion, but he appears in a lot of the Gnostic Gospels on many occasions. Now, Simon Magus, as the name would suggest, was a magician. He was a magi. He was one of these magi that came out of um, Persia, Parthia, to see Jesus. And of course, this links into what I've said before about the biblical fam family coming out of uh, Persia, Parthia. They were the Babylonian Jews who came out of Parthia and settled in Syria and Judea. And amongst them, of course, were magi. And Simon was one of those magi. He was Simon Magus, the magician. And the magicians were, uh, they were wise men, they were teachers, they were priests, they were astrologers, and they were government officials as well in Parthia, which is where we get the name magistrate from. They were the magi. So um, it was the same Simon Magus, this same Simon Magus, who had the great debate with uh, St. Peter in Caesarea uh, in the AD 60s. And 3,000 people came to Caesarea to see this great debate between Simon Magus and, and St. Peter, debating between simple Judaism and Nazarene Gnosticism, trying to determine which was uh, the true religion that should be taught to the people. Do you go via simple Judaism, Judaism for Gentiles, or do you go via Nazarene Gnosticism, which was this Egypto-Judaic uh, religion that venerated the Zodiac, as we've seen before on that talk in uh, the second lecture on the uh, Zodiacs in Galilee. So, yeah, this was a, a great event. 3,000 people coming to this great conference in Caesarea in Judea. Um, and of course, this is not in the Gospels because you, the Gospels are very selective on what they're going to tell you. This is in the Clementine homilies and recognitions. They are Gnostic 
um, Gospels that come out of the same era. These are very early documents, and they give you this alternate perspective on Gospel-type events and Gospel characters, because Simon Magus and St. Peter are both in the Gospel stories, of course. Anyway, St. Peter is allowed to win this debate, um, which I, I suppose they had to do this in a way, because simple Judaism, Christianity, was becoming dominant. And so if you went against uh, Christianity, you were, you were maybe even putting your life in jeopardy. So uh, the Clementine recognitions allow St. Peter to win this debate. However, the criticism that is made of simple Judaism, Christianity, is devastating to that religion. So while they allow St. Peter to win the debate, um, truly, he didn't completely win this debate at all. For instance, Simon says, as Simon always does say, um, he, he's looking at the nature of God here. And Simon says to St. Peter, It is possible for me to infer, by the evils which are done in this world and are not corrected, that either the, either the Creator is powerless, or else if he does not wish to remove the evils in this world, that he himself is evil. But if he neither can nor will correct these evils, he is neither powerful nor good. How true. And this is not a 19th century or 20th century argument against the divinity of God. This is, this is the first century AD debating the divinity and power of, of, of the God. Um, <clears throat> because Simon is correct. God cannot be omnipresent and omnipotent if there is still evil in the world because he could correct them. Any of these evils, whether it's tsunamis or hurricanes or uh, disease, any of the natural disasters we see in the world, if God is not correcting these di disasters, then the traditional view of God cannot be correct. And you've only got a few choices here. Either the God is not omnipresent, which means he's away, much of the time, and so he can't correct any of these evils. You know, he's, he's, he's away looking at a, another planet with another civilization around Alpha Centauri or something, so he's not here, so he can't correct these evils on planet Earth. So he's not omnipresent. Or maybe he's not omnipotent. He's a bit of a weakling, and he can't stop any of these natural disasters. He's powerless. He's impotent. He's a bit useless, really. Or, God is evil. He's like a little boy sticking a stick into an ant's nest to see all the ants scurrying around trying to um, correct the damage made to their ant nest. So which is it? Is God not omnipresent? Is he not omnipotent? Or is he just evil? Well, that is the notion that Simon Magus was putting across in this great debate in Caesarea in the AD 60s, during the Gospel era. Uh, but this is not, of course, reported in the Gospels because they don't want to introduce those um, little problems into the Gospel story. Anyway, that's not what we were going to discuss here. We were discussing miracles. And Simon Magus has a miracle. When he has many, many miracles, he was a magician, of course, and he had many of these miracles. Um, but this is an interesting one. And, of course, this was rejected as being magic, not a miracle, because he was only a magician. And uh, he couldn't do miracles. He was not the Messiah. He was just a naughty boy. So Simon Magus says, By turning air into water and water again into blood, and solidifying it into flesh, I formed a new human creature, a boy, and produced a much nobler work than God the Creator. For he created a man from earth, but I created a boy from air. A far more difficult matter. 
And then I unmade him and restored him to air, but not until I had placed his picture and image in my bedchamber as a proof and memorial of my work. Interesting. So what was he talking about here? Again, you could say this is just nonsense, this is fairy tales, this has all been made up. But it could be science. And the giveaway here is that it happened in his bedchamber. And what is a bedchamber? It's a dark room. Well, quite often it's a dark room. And in Latin, a dark room is a camera obscura. A camera is a, a room. An obscura is darkness. So this happened, this, this little boy, the image of the boy, happened in a camera obscura. And of course, what is a camera obscura? Well, it's, it's one of these. Here's a very early image of a, a camera obscura. It's a dark room and a small hole in the wall. That's all it is. And through the small hole, the image of whatever is outside is projected onto the back wall of the bedchamber, the dark room. And this produces a, a very astounding image, actually. Um, the image is always upside down, so the boy would have to be upside down, unless, of course, they tipped the boy upside down outside, and then the image of the boy would be up the right way. Um, but this would be a very astounding image because you could, you, you could shout to the boy, lift your arms, and the image on the back wall of your bedchamber would lift its arms. It's a proper video image. They are very, well, look at this in a minute, but the image you get from a camera obscura can be almost video quality. It would be like, first century aristocracy and royalty in this dark room looking at a cinema picture of this boy who was moving. It wasn't just an image. It wasn't something painted on the wall. The boy was moving and his mouth could move. You could ask him questions and he could say yes or no in the equivalent Aramaic, of course. It would be utterly amazing to people of the first century AD. You can imagine the power of this sort of technology that you could amaze people so much and say, I'm doing this through the power of God, flowing through me. I can create this image on the wall that you can't do. Well, now, is this too advanced for the first century? Do you think that this, this is not possible in the first century? Well, think again, because... I did this by accident, so anyone could have done this by accident at any time in the last five, six, seven, eight thousand years. Because it happened to me by accident, and it was actually quite amazing, because I'd never seen this before. Um, just sitting in a bedchamber, a dark room, in a very run-down, two-star, perhaps only one-star, hotel in the Mediterranean. Now, yeah, the Mediterranean helps because you get very bright sunlight outside, which can help project a picture. So there I was, waking up in bed in this run-down old hotel. And it was so decrepit, this hotel, that all of the curtains had holes along the top of the curtains. And each of these little holes in the curtains was making a camera obscura picture which was being uh, displayed, it was being projected onto the ceiling, the white ceiling of this run-down old hotel. So there I was lying in bed, and on the ceiling of my room, there was the entire picture of the world outside. There was the houses, there was the, the shops, there was the cars driving along, there was the people on the pavement, and you could see them all walking across my ceiling in the early morning. It was quite, I just sat there watching it for ages because it was so fascinating watching all these cars driving past on my ceiling in video quality. You can imagine that in the uh, first century. So anyone from any age could have 
discovered this by accident, just the same as I discovered it by accident, and discovered that it was coming from this little hole uh, in my curtains. And I, I didn't manage to take a picture of this, actually. I should have done. But anyway, here is someone who did manage to take a picture. This was someone in an old house. I think this was in um, uh, Czechoslovakia somewhere. Czech Republic, as it is now. And they were in an old house. And the, the tiles were coming off in this old house. And there was a, a small gap in the tiles uh, as they went up into the attic. And through this small hole, a picture of the shops or the palace opposite was being projected onto the wall. And here is the picture. Um, and as you can see, we've got the entire view of the palace across the road projected onto this wall. Upside down, of course, because always a um, camera obscure always projects upside down. And you can see just the quality. And, 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 these images are, are, are relatively faint, of course, so they're not easy to capture with a camera. But the camera has captured these images fairly well. You can see all of the detail of this palace across the road. This is the quality you can get from a camera obscura. And as I said before, you can, ama you can imagine how the aristocracy would be amazed with this picture on the wall of this dark room. A picture that is not simply a picture, a static picture, an image. A picture that moves. The horses and people outside would be moving along. And how could that happen? How could these images be moving on this back wall of this dark room? It would be incredible, wouldn't it? It would be a miracle. And this is the miracle that Simon Magus made, uh, although it was dismissed as magic because he wasn't the Messiah. He was just a naughty boy. And so he was creating magic. But the difference between magic and miracles is wafer thin, to say the least. So in my view, all miracles are scientific contrivances or deceptions, deliberately made quite often in order to amaze the public, the aristocracy, the royalty. But people in the modern era have lived their life on these lies, on these deceptions. They are living a life on self-deception. And it's sad that that can happen still in the 21st century, that people cannot see the reality behind these deceptive miracles. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this short talk on miracles, and I hope you can join us again soon in these Illumination lectures.